he thought I was like attacking TJ and he's got me pinned up against the thing. And I look at TJ, I'm like, TJ, tell him like, tell him everything's good. And he looks at me, he's like, ha ha. He starts laughing at me. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode here on You Think, presented by Audiorama and Sports Refund. Um, I know the last time you guys heard me, I was talking about our trip down to Florida for the Pop Warner National Championship Super Bowl. Uh, today's guest, we're going to talk a lot about it. So we will have a full report of how we did. We went down there. We had a great time. Um, Lou Keekley, as you know, he's not only today's guest, he's our defensive coordinator, former teammate, good buddy of mine. I'm um, really happy to have him on the show. Really fortunate that he took some time to join us today on You Think to talk about all the struggles of uh, of youth sports coaching. It was Luke's first time doing it. He has no kids, um, obviously not on the team. He has no kids in general. So for him, it was really his first time around young kids coaching and stuff. So we had a blast doing it together. Uh, we had a great time in Florida. Got to take the kids to Universal Studios. Uh, we won our first game against the Hollister Vikings out of Northern California. We then drew a really good team from outside of Philly, uh, the Abington Raiders, and uh, they beat us in the semifinals. So we didn't we didn't quite make it to the final three, you know, to the third game. We only played two, but uh, the fact that we made it down there, the fact that we won our region, won our state, won our city, uh, was a pretty impressive feat, uh, considering it was our first year doing it. So we've learned a lot. We are going to be better next year. I'm on like a mission to make our team even better, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how that works, but uh, we're super pumped about today's guest, Luke Keekley. Obviously, you guys all probably know who he is, former linebacker, teammate of mine, one of the all-time best players, probably a first ballot Hall of Famer, but more importantly, a youth football coach, thanks to me begging him to do it, and uh, I think I have him hooked now. So appreciate you guys uh, listening. I hope you enjoy the conversation with Luke. Uh, thank you so much to our new sponsor, Sports Refund. Uh, when kids sign up to play youth sports, obviously, there's a million fees. I've talked to you guys about that between the travel, the, the fee to be on the team, um, what the teams pay to register for the tournaments, insurance, there's a, a million things, um, you know, so, and parents pay those fees so their child can be on the team. And then God forbid, if you miss some time, what happens to the money you just paid when your child is no longer able to play? And that's why I think sports refund is so cool. I think parents out there with kids playing youth sports, I think you're going to find it really cool. It's a low cost, sports fee, it's insurance. It's insurance against if your child, your son or daughter is unable to play, to pay, whether they're injured or sick, um, it allows you to kind of recover some of the fees that you paid up front, which we all know sometimes are, are pretty extensive. So it's a really cool program. It's not only saves families from wasted fees, it saves injured athletes from the stress of feeling like they're wasting their parents' money or I'm not able to get out there and play. So I think it serves everyone. It serves the athlete, it serves the family and allows people to get back out there and keep sports accessible, keep sports, you know, not to be too expensive and uh, appropriate for everybody. So appreciate Sports Refund for being a part of our team here. So ask your club if they offer it. If not, you guys can go visit um, sportsrefund.com backslash youth inc. You can learn more and sign up today. Can't play, don't pay with Sports Refund. So now please enjoy this conversation with my good buddy, former Carolina Panther, Luke Keekley. Defensive coordinator of the South Charlotte Patriots, Luke Keekley. <laughs> I mean, that's that's all we talk about now. Is there? I mean, is there anything else in life? No, not right now. Right now, I have I have a note that we took. We just had breakfast. I have a whole note of things we need to talk about at practice. Hold on, hold that back up. We're going to capture that. What what do we got on there? We've got Mason at DB end of game situations, goal line, uh, vice tackle drills, three by one. What is that? Mason needs to widen and then smoke rules. <laughs> Mason's got a lot to do tonight. Yeah, and then here's our – he'll be our, our script on our uh, – Well, don't show him. Don't show him. That's secret. Yeah, That's secret. We'll, we'll, have have blurry, we'll blur that out. We'll blur we'll that out. We'll push this out after, after the game. Yeah, we'll oh, this doesn't come out until next week, so we'll already be in the championship by the time this airs, so we're good. Yeah, and if we're we safe. The, yeah, perfect. Well, for anyone who doesn't know, and if you don't know, that just means you've never once listened. This is your first time ever listening to an episode of You Think. Um, we've taken our Pop Warner – football season very, very seriously and it's paying off. So I just, I want to remind everyone and we're going to put them, we're going to table the pop Warner talk and go back to the beginning. We'll come back to it. I first approached Luke like last spring. So like spring of 2021, I approached Luke. We're having lunch. I was like, Hey, what do you think you're going to do next fall? 
And he's like, I don't know. Like at the time he was fin- doing some stuff with the Panthers and coaching and scouting, whatever. He's like, I'm not sure. I said, well, Hey, if you're not doing anything else, what would be your interest in doing like a fifth and sixth grade tackle football? I think Tate, my oldest son is going to play. He's like, I was like, do you want to do it with me and my dad? And he was like, Oh my God. Yes. So like, I didn't, you know, I was like, okay, cool. I'll let you know. Well, like every month I got a call from Luke, like, Hey, any more info on football, any more info on football. And here we are. So Luke really quick, what's been the experience? Like, would you do it again? Do you love it? Hate it? And, and then we're going to come back to it here in a little bit, but I just need to just introduce this to everyone. What's been your experience for the first time being a youth sports coach? I'd a hundred percent do it again. And I think what we realized is that first game, we didn't know what to expect. I, I had a great idea of what I thought we were going to do on defense. That was terrible. Um, my whole idea of going about coaching was wrong. Um, so that first, that first game was tough, but it's fun. The kids are so excited and they get so excited and they want to win just as bad as you want to win. So it's like, I got to do everything I can to make sure that what, whether we're watching tape or switching up game plans or switching defense or writing stuff on napkins, it's super fun. I think the kids have a great time, but I would argue that you and I might have a little bit more fun than the kids do. Oh, there's no question. Luke, Luke and I go to lunch minimum twice a week but we've been in the routine the last couple of weeks where every Thursday, which is like following our last practice of the week, every Thursday we go to like an end of the week lunch where we just walk into like a restaurant in Charlotte and we have like notebooks and scrap paper. And Luke's got his notebook, like the same notebook that Luke prepared to play in the Super Bowl, is the same notebook. Now Luke is preparing to go to a 11 year old football practice. And that's not bullshit. That's like full the truth. It's all we talk about. It's, obsessive and it's awesome. What else would we do? No, I mean, I have, so the, the back to that notebook, the notebooks that we had in Carolina were awesome. Like half of it, half of it was, um, like formation, little formations that you could draw different things. And the other half was a notebook. So it was perfect. Um, and I loved them so much that I just had five or six of them left over from when I was playing and I had them all in my, uh, in my drawer here. I don't know what we're going to do next year. Cause I've used pretty much, I've used probably half of them. So I got we'll to go more. back to the Panthers and go snag a few more of them for next and year. And we are the South Charlotte Patriots have an unlimited budget. <laughs> so we are, we're going to load up on, on notebooks. All right. So we're, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Cause I want to dive a little deeper into, into the whole experience, but I want to take everyone back to the beginning. Like everyone who has a somewhat of a clue of the NFL is obviously familiar with what you accomplished with the Panthers we were teammates together. Like I said, on in the intro, you've won every award a defensive player can win pro bowls, all pros accomplished. There's nothing else you didn't accomplish, but I want you to give everyone, I, I know what your childhood was like. I know growing up in Ohio and, and going to St. X and you're, I want you to tell our listeners, like what was youth sports like for Luke Keekley? Were you the best kid? Were you the dominant kid? Were you playing a hundred different sports and you were like always the man, just take us back to the beginning growing up what sports was like in your family? Yeah. So we started playing soccer when we were, I don't know, six or seven or eight, whatever we could start playing soccer is when we first started doing that. And that was the first, first sport that I played. And then you transition to basketball in the winter. And then I started playing football in the fourth grade. And that was probably my first real, I never played flag. I never went to camps, football camps, really. Um, the first time I ever played was in fourth grade. And our, our program throughout grade school was really good for a lot of reasons. One of them was the guys that had been coaching there have been coaching there for a long time. So the guy that, that coached third and fourth had been there for probably 20 years. He just retired maybe two or three years ago. The fifth and sixth grade coach was always usually one of the dads, but then the seventh and eighth grade coach was a guy named Ralph. Ralph was there just like Kevin Harris, the guy in third and fourth grade for 20 years. And they did such a great job because the, 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 the schematic stuff was great. Everybody played blah, blah, blah. But the discipline that we got at that young age, I think was, was what really carried me over. I think every area in my football career had something different, but I think that the discipline, respecting the game, how we did things, showing up to practice, being on time. Yes, sir. No, sir. Um, how we treated officials. There was one game where a buddy of mine caught a big ball over, over the middle of the field for a big third down conversion. This was in fourth grade. He spiked the ball. They took him out. He didn't play the rest of the game. He's one of our best players. So it was very early on in my football career that I realized, hey, football is important, but no one's bigger than the team. And this is how we're going to do things. And we're going to do things the right way. And I think that's how I started. But growing up, I mean, 
I played football, basketball, lacrosse. Those are my three sports. Um, got in the high school, dropped basketball, only played football and lacrosse. And then winter was primarily um, weight, weight stuff. I had a really good, I was fortunate to play at a really good school. We had a really good off season weight program. And it was kind of one of those things that if you weren't, if you weren't doing anything in the winter, you were required to be there for football stuff. So if you wanted to go play basketball, that was totally great. Go play basketball. But if you weren't, if you weren't playing basketball, you had to be there for, um, for, for winter workouts. I mean, if you wrestled that counted too, but winter workouts were a big deal, not only for your development, but you got to know the guys in the program. You got to be around the older guys. You got to see how things are done the right way. And it was a big deal because it was kind of a rite of passage going from freshman to sophomore, sophomore to junior, obviously into your senior year. One of my favorites, I laughed when you were saying what sports you played as a kid, because one of my favorite stories of yours is when, uh, remember TJ, so my younger son, TJ, we were at lunch or something and Luke was like, how'd your baseball team, how'd your baseball game go? <laughs> and he's like, well, I didn't do that good. I struck out twice or whatever it was. And Luke goes, Hey, if it makes you feel any better, I stopped playing baseball because I struck out every single time. And I just started playing lacrosse. <laughs> yeah. Well, the only way to get on base was if they dropped the third strike, I'd run to first. <laughs> I don't know why, but that like the vision of like Luke Keekley that we all know, but like it met, my son's like, all right. Well, Luke Keekley struck out a lot too. So I'm going to be fine. <laughs> I don't know so, if he should compare himself. It to me was so that. good though. So every time you say lacrosse, like, obviously I can only imagine what you were like on a lacrosse field, just absolutely assassinating people. But I just think back to like young Luke Keekley, like his parents can't figure out why he can't hit the ball. And now 20 years <laughs> later, he's like a first ballot hall of fame football player. I don't know why, but that to me is like an amazing contrast of the Luke that we all know, but just shows sometimes when you're young, things are a little different. Yeah, it just wasn't the sport for me. I don't know what it was. I think I think a lot of times fine motor skills for me. So so like golf, tennis, basketball, um, even a little bit with lacrosse, like stick handling and ball handling. That's never been what I've been good at. I've always been able to catch stuff well, like catch basketballs, catch footballs, catch baseballs. But like throwing um, the stuff with lacrosse, basketball, golf, like fine motor skills with my hands have never been have never been good for me. I'm with you. I was never the point guard. I was never the shooter. I was like the guy in high school, like even in high school, when it was basketball season, I was like, all right, coach, I'll go guard their best kid. I'll go fight for rebounds under the basket. I'll battle my ass off. But like, I'm not bringing the ball up versus the press, yeah. right? Like I'm not, I'm, <laughs> that's just not my deal. I was never the quarterback. So I'm with you. Uh, I'm with you there. So, so you can keep moving on. You mentioned your high school and, and I want to, I want to have you dive back into it. Cause again, St. St. Xavier, St. X that is what they call it. Mm -hmm. Where Luke went in Ohio, all boys school, pow, national, national powerhouse. They play a national schedule. I just think it's so cool. Like thinking back to the high school experience I have, when I talked to Luke, it was very different. We played all teams in our local area. We had a league and then you'd go on to the playoffs and play across the state. But Luke, tell everyone you're playing teams from all over the country. You're playing teams from I'll let you tell it, but like, it's a really cool experience as, as a young kid, what you went through in high school. Yeah. And so what, what made St. X really good is, is it was a, it was a true program. Like this is how we do things. It doesn't matter if you're on the varsity, the JV or the freshman team, this is how we're going to do it. We're not cutting any kids. So our freshman team had like 140 kids. That was all freshmen. The JV team had like 70 or 80 kids. And then the varsity team was juniors and seniors that was like 120 to 140 kids when I was playing, it was packed. So as long as you showed up, you did what was required of you, you came to practice, your grades were good, you treated people right, you were always on the team. And I think what that helped to give guys was just a sense of community, sense of team, that you do the work regardless if you're a good player, you're not as good of a player, you're gonna be on the team. So I think that helped and you just walking around, you always wanted, when you're a freshman, you're like, man, you go watch games on Friday. You always want to be those older guys. You always want to be Alex Albright was a guy. He was a defensive end when I was playing. He was just stud defensive end, single digit visor baller, went to Boston college. Big reason why I went there, but you always wanted to be that guy. You want to run out of the field, run out on the field on Friday night under the lights and everyone's cheering for you. But it was cool though. We played, like you mentioned, we played a national, a national schedule. So my junior year, we played teams from obviously Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky. Um, we played a team from Maryland. My, my senior year, we played teams from Alabama, Indiana, 
Kentucky and Jersey, we played Bosco. So yeah, we were just, we were very fortunate. There was a thing called the Herb Street Classic and it was all local Cincinnati or Ohio teams and you go play a national schedule. So we played like Lakeland, Florida. We played Prattville, Alabama. Um, who did we play? Damatha. Damatha was a Catholic school out of Maryland. Yeah, down in Maryland, yeah. Yeah, and it was awesome for us because not only did you get to play a national schedule, but you got to play different types of programs. So, you know, you grew up in Cincinnati. It's a lot of the same kind of teams. They, they do a lot of the same team, a lot of the same things, but then you go play Prattville, Alabama, and it's it's spread. It's a different kind of player. It's bigger, it's stronger. You got to find distinct advantages. You played in big stadiums, so we played at Paul Brown Stadium where the Bengals played. We played at Nippert where UC plays. You're playing on these big, huge stadiums, and the thing that was cool is that they would have games all afternoon, and we would usually be at the night game, so they would have like a early afternoon game, a middle game, and then you'd play at night, so then all those fans would accumulate from that first game, so you wouldn't have – Five ten thousand people. You the one game that it was my freshman year, sophomore year. There was like thirty five thousand people at a high school football game. It was <laughs> crazy. It was crazy. And then the games were broadcast nationally. So we played a game. I think my junior year when we were really good on ESPN two, and it wasn't like ESPN, you know, you or anything. It was ESPN two. We were the national game. That people came to the practice and watched us and. It was kind of like what you do in the NFL. The production crew comes, they talk to the head coach and like two or three guys. It was awesome. How many and how many of those games did you lose? Oh man. You won most of them, didn't you? Yeah. So my junior year we were really good. We beat all the team. We were 15 and 0 my junior year. My senior year weren't as good, but we beat Prattville. We beat Bosco. Um, we played so a team from Indiana, my, Kentucky. My yeah. point is you guys were going around the entire country playing every single top program that would play you. And not only were you playing and competing, you guys were winning. And, and the point of me bringing that up, like at what point you have 200 kids in the program, historical powerhouse program, all boys, the whole thing. Like at what point did you just go from Luke and this is a good player. This kid's got a young chance. He's a linebacker. He's pretty smart. He's aggressive he, to like, okay, this guy is a dude. Like this guy is a national recruit. He's getting recruited by Stanford. I'm, I'm going to bring up the Notre Dame story. Yeah. But like, when did it click where everyone started saying, okay, this dude is different. So my, my freshman year, I come in, there's 140 kids. I break my foot like the second day of training camp. We're doing, we're doing conditioning drills. I'm going over a bag. I break my foot. I'm out for six weeks. I don't play hardly at all. Um, the first like half of the season we had, we had an A team and a B team. So all the other schools around Cincinnati had this freshman teams had the same team. So you would have, you go play like one team, you play the B game on a Wednesday and then the A game on a Thursday. So then, you know, there's 70, 70 kids in the A team, 70 kids in the B team, but every practice is together. So for that, for my, my freshman year, I was on the B team for the majority of the time. I was small, I was undersized, but I was playing linebacker. My sophomore year comes around. I'm still not real big. I'm still not real fast. We had a bunch of linebackers, so they moved me to tight end. So I played tight end my sophomore year and we, we ran the ball a bunch, had a couple routes. And then my junior year, I, and this, this was spring of my sophomore year. And I'm like, man, I'm going to be a junior next year. I'm going to be on the varsity team. Um, I want to go back to defense, but I'm just like, I got to do what I'm, what I'm asking. I remember real quick, do any freshman or sophomore ever play varsity at St. X every once in a while. So no freshman really ever do sophomores. You might get one or two a year, but you did not. Nope. Nope. Okay. My class, we had one kid, we had one kid played up. And whatever happened to him? He played at Wisconsin. Okay, so he was yeah. a dude. Okay, so he was legit. Okay, so, so sorry, that, go ahead. I just wanted yeah. to set the expectations. So then I go and I'm going in the spring of my sophomore year. Coach Steve Speck, their head coach, comes up to me and said, hey, I'm going to move you to linebacker. Are you okay with that? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. So I go into my junior year playing linebacker. I end up winning the job. But I wasn't the guy on the team. They, we had <clears> – <throat> there was 22 starters. I think 19 of them played college football. Yeah, Ivy League kids. We had a and couple, everyone like, played one way. Yeah, one way. So I played defense. We had we had a running back that was – he was the best running back our program's ever had. His name was Darius Ashley. He was like 2,000 yards a year. We had a guy, Fred Craig, on defense that he started as a sophomore. He was like the truth. Sophomore year, junior year, senior, went to Stanford. We had, we had five or six other guys that were like big-time recruits. So my junior year, I kind of just flew under the table. I was small. I was skinny. Um but then as my senior year came along, I started getting recruited 
after my junior year, but my senior year is when I really, I put on some size, I put weight on, I switched positions to more like a rover spot and that really highlighted my ability. So I think after my junior year, there was some buzz, but going into my senior year and once I'm like five or six games into my senior year, that's kind of really when I came into my own. All right. So, so get into the recruiting process. So now you're one of the best players on one of the best teams in the country. You've kind of come out from the, the shadows of some of these other guys you just mentioned. And now you get onto the recruiting scene, tell everybody what your dream school was and tell everybody how it all worked out that you ended yeah. up going to Boston college. So when I was growing up, I was a big, everybody in Cincinnati, you're a Notre Dame fan, just growing up. Um, my grandma and grandpa were huge Notre Dame fans. My grandpa had blue and gold. He watched the games all the time. I used to read the little magazines. I had a Ryan Grant poster in Ryan my Grant. Yeah. From my, Don Bosco. Yeah. Number four, you'd advise you was sick. I loved yeah. him. Um, that's where I always wanted to go. And so recruiting got started. And I, like I said, I came on late. I was small. I was undersized. And you know, the, the offer, the offer never really came. There was, I went to a Catholic or Jesuit all boys school in Cincinnati. There was a Jesuit all boys school in Cleveland. Um, we both played the same defenses. We ran a three, three, five. I was like the fifth DB Rover hybrid backer. Ignatius Cleveland, San Ignatius was like our brother school up in Cleveland. They had the same defense, the same school, the same kid, a white kid, number three, my same number, um, Dan Fox, but he was six, four, two thirty, big, long, physical could run. Um, and I think they came to Ohio and like, we're going to pick the best one of these kids. And if I was Notre Dame, I would have picked Dan Fox too. Bigger, stronger, faster, great program. Um, so that was, and then Manti Teo and Carlo Calbrizi was, was a Jersey kid. Um, those were the three backers that they picked. And I was like, dang, like. Where the, the Fox kid went to Notre Dame? Yeah, Dan Fox, yeah, 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 Carlo yeah. Calbrizi, and then Manti, Manti was it. up there. So, I mean, I mean, coming out, I mean, I didn't pop until my senior year. Dan Fox was a grown man sophomore, junior year. So I don't even, I just remember. So Ignatius would come every year. Um, we would go play up there or they would come play down in Cincinnati. And what we would do is they, the kids. So my sophomore year, we played, we played Ignatius at home. So we housed the Ignatius players and we housed, we housed the kid from Ignatius. He came, spent the night at our house. My mom made him breakfast in the morning. But that's I always, the most Luke Keekley story of all time. But that the was the whole school. The whole school that day. was the most Luke Keekley thing I've ever heard. But go ahead. And I just remember walking out on the field and I kind of knew about like I kind of knew about Dan Fox a little bit. And like he was like my arch nemesis for for like three years. And then I met him one time after a game at Notre Dame. And I'm like, gosh, this guy's this guy's super cool. So, you know how you know how it goes when, when you played him your senior year. How'd it go? Oh, man, my senior year. They they beat us. My senior Damn it. Year. I know. How'd you I do? Know. Did you ball? We, played, we played pretty well. Yeah. We played of course well. you did. That's good. So obviously you end up going to Boston college. So first time, so I'm going to tell my first ever finding out who Luke Keekley was. So obviously in being in the ACC at the time, you know, I'd follow Miami living in, in Charlotte, ACC country. I'm watching a Miami game. I think it was your last year there. So you would have been a junior, right? Mm -hmm. When you pick sixth Miami. Yeah. That was your last year there. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching the Miami game. They're playing Boston college. I don't, really particularly know a lot about Boston college currently, but I know they got this white kid, number 44, that's running around and he makes every tackle, but I'm like, okay, I mean, he's, he's a good player. He makes a lot of tackles, but you know, whatever. And then he picks six Miami and every kid on Miami, as he was running to the end zone, not only were they not catching him, they were getting further away from you as you're running. And I'm like, holy shit, this fucking white kid is flying. So I don't think anything of it. Now, fast forward to the off season. I'm in the weight room working out. And at the time you would bring in guys for, I guess they still do this, right? Like yeah. pre-draft visits. So all of a sudden this kid walks in with like some of our scouting directors and whatnot. And, um, he walks in, I think you had glasses on, you were like dressed really nice. You'd have had like a button down or a sweater or something. I'm in the weight room lifting and Luke comes over and they introduce, Hey, this is Luke Keekley from Boston college. He's here on a visit. So we shake, you know, we talk mingle for a little bit and he walks away. So I call one of the scouting guys over after Luke leaves. I'm like, Hey, tell me about that kid. Cause now all of a sudden this image of him inner pick six in Miami pops back into my head. I'm like, how good is he? Like, I'm like, we're looking at him as the number one pick. At the, where, where, where were we? 10, 11, nine. what did we pick? Nine. nine at you, yeah. So I'm like, we got a top 10 pick. I'm like, we're going to take that kid. They're like, Greg, he not only was the best defensive player in the ACC, he was the best player period in the entire conference. 
and arguably the top handful of players in the entire country. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. They're like, I promise you, this kid is the best. I'm like, okay. So we draft Luke at nine. And I remember seeing his first practice and I was like, oh my God, this was what it must have been like a couple of years before I got to Chicago with Erlacher. He was the fastest guy in the field. He knew where every ball was going to go. But little did I know when I met him in the weight room that day, like I was like, hey, I'm sure he's a great player. So I'm, and I was like, holy shit, we're taking this kid at number nine. And he goes on to be the defensive rookie of the year, defensive player of the year, and arguably the best player in the history of the franchise. So that, that was yeah. our experience meeting Luke Keekly. Well, I had, I walked in, I had, I remember what I, I remember what I wore. I wore a pair of like khaki pants. I had a, like a red and white checkered button down shirt, my glasses and an Afro. And Greg, you're probably like, man, we're going to interview this guy. He's going to work upstairs. He's going to be <laughs> our, our scouting, like he's going to be a scouting intern. I, I mean, I knew you were good because, again, I, I had that image of that play you made against Miami. And I knew from just, like, following draft stuff that, like, you were a first-round guy and, like, a legit dude. You made, like, 7,000 tackles, set, set NC records, whatever it was. So, like, I knew you were good. I don't know if I knew you were, like, a top-10 pick and then, of course, went on to do what you did. But, like, I think back to that first time meeting you in the weight room, and I'm like, little did we know. That little you had a beanie on. You had a beanie on too. Oh, I remember that. Always. How many? <laughs> hey, how good were our moments in the weight room? Oh my gosh, that was. Did you ever trade those days in? No, no. Tell Every everybody. Off-season. Tell everybody our off-season summer program. <clears throat> just, just go outside, get fast, bomberitos, <sighs> bomberitos, speed stuff. So we had our we had our what four day split. So we had we had our linear day was at the end with the pulleys. We had our. Um, all of our change of direction change stuff. Of direction. And then we had all the hurdle drills, like the, oh. that stuff was like on Mondays. And then we'd come in and then you'd always have, you always have to walk in with your shirt off. Cause we were sweating. Had to, had to had walk to, in with your shirt off. That was mandatory. King, Kings of Leon all day. Music blasting. And we would just come in. in the weight room and just crush. And we would just know that on that <laughs> given day, it was the best shape we'd ever be in. And then throughout the course of the season, we would just get progressively worse. worse. You start wearing more clothes as the season goes on. Oh, I was on. in a hoodie by the end of the year. Yeah. I wouldn't even take my shirt off in the shower. <laughs> um, so one thing before, before we move on to a different topic, I just all, all joking aside and we all joke of all players I've ever played with. You were the best mix of obviously you were talented. And I feel like every time people talk about players are so smart and all that, they discount how physically talented they are. So I don't want to do that you were as physically gifted on the field as anyone, if not more. So I don't want to discredit that. But again, in my opinion, just from playing against you and then watching you for all those years and just knowing you the way I do, I'd never been around a guy who had the mix of the physical talent, the strength, the tackling, the coverage, all that stuff that you could do. But you knew every single play before it was going to happen. And that's not because you were lucky. Your prep during the week and the hours in the room, we'd walk out at seven o'clock at night and we'd leave and we'd peek in the linebacker room and you were the guy there. Like, give everyone a sense of what made you, you, as far as your approach and how you approach the game, how you studied it, how, how much you cared about it. Because I think if there's one thing people can learn from you, it's yes, you want to run four or five and you want to tackle people and all that. But if they could learn one thing from you, in my opinion, it's the way you went about your business is what made you so special. Yeah, I think I think a lot of it started in high school. So when when I was a junior, my junior senior year, we would we would go down at lunchtime to our head coach's office, and he'd have he'd have game tape on old VHS VHS tapes, and we'd eat our lunch down there. He'd put the game on the TV, and we'd kind of watch it. We kind of talk. We kind of eat our lunch, but you know, every once in a while, he'd be like, "Hey." We need to watch this play. This is what we're going to get. This is get, this gives us problems. And then he'd be like, you got it. You got it. You got it. There'd be like three or four guys down there. And you'd be like, yeah, I got it. And then you'd see it at practice and you see it at a game. And then either you'd, you'd recognize it in the game, you were able to make the play or you wouldn't recognize it. And then, and then they'd hit it. So then the next day you'd come in and, and he'd be like, Hey, great job on your recognition. We talked about this during the week or he'd be like, Hey, we talked about this. You didn't get it right. Like, why didn't you recognize it? And so early on for me, it was how can you find ways to get ahead, get an advantage um, and, and win and win plays, not so much just win the game, but win each individual plays and ultimately have success. So I had success with it early on in high school. And then when I got to college, we had a safety 
named Wes Davis. He was two years older than I was, two or three years older than I was. And he was a huge tape guy, safety out of California. And he took me under his wing. And, you know, when you get to high school or college, you have everything. You can break it down. Personnel, down and distance, situations. You have it. It's like Disney World for watching tape. You can do whatever you want. And I'd go in there and watch tape with Wes. And he kind of showed me how to break stuff down and why we're doing this and how we're going to play it. And you learn to have, you learn that it provides you the opportunity to have a ton of success. And I had success within college. And then I got to the NFL and then the NFL, that's where it really se- guys separate. So what do you do really well? What do you do really bad? Whatever you do really bad, they're going to find it. So for me, it was, all right, I know, I know I can do this. I know I can do this. I know I can do this. The tape for me was one thing where I was really able to differentiate myself. And I honestly, I really just enjoyed it. Like it didn't feel like extra work to me. I didn't feel like I was like grinding. I loved it. Like I loved learning about the game. I loved watching different guys and how they played stuff. Cause you never know, like maybe you watch a running back and he runs outside zone one way. And he's, he's way more physical when he sticks his right foot in the ground than his left foot. And then you get into the game and then all that stuff just slows down for you. Because when I was a rookie, I played, I played inside backer, outside backer. And physically I was getting crushed. Like I wasn't real physical. I wasn't very strong. I wasn't, you know, I could run, but that like, if they ran the ball right at me, I had a severe disadvantage. So I was like, how can I get an advantage? And one thing that I knew how to do really well was watch tape from watching again, high school and college. And that was a big benefit me early, early on in my career. And I had so much success with it that I was like, how can I get better at it? How can I refine it? Because it's amazing to me. And it's so cool when you watch stuff during the week and you get a look and you get a situation and you write a note down and you're like, boom, if I get quarters, this game in this situation, I can make a play on the ball and then boom, you don't get it at, during the week at practice. You don't get it the first 60 plays of the game, but that 63rd play in the game when it's third and nine and you get a formation and a certain guy's lined up here and the splits this and you jump a route and you make a play. It's like, to me, it's awesome. I love that. Like the NFC championship when you worked all yeah. week on, on Larry Fitz's little hook route and you missed it the yeah. first time. Dude, That's my favorite so Luke I- Keekly story of all time. Mm-hmm. So we got it. I, I, I think it was, it, it was, I think it was John. I think it was John Brown was the guy. Oh, what? Okay. He lined up, okay. I think it was him. It was a speed guy. It was a fast guy. They lined up and they lined up in three by one. They would, um, they push vertically. They'd sit a guy down and then Carson, it was like a timing route. Carson would pin it on his chest. Um, and so we got it. Mind you, this on. is the, this is to go to the Super Bowl. Mind you, this is the NFC championship. So I had that play circled. I'm like, Boom, if we get quarters, I'm going to have help over the top. I'm going to pick this ball. Like not even going to think about it. Um, so they came out the first time. This was in this. I think this was in the second quarter at the end of the half or something. <clears throat> they line up in it. We're in quarters. I have help over the top. I'm like money going to pick this ball. And he came up and I was like a step off and, I, and he caught it. And it was like catch tackle. So nine yards doesn't kill us, but like pisses you off because wrote it down. Great call, Med McDermott everything I needed missed it. Like that was like grinding me. And then we got it at the end of the game again. And I was like, all right, I'm going to change where I line. I'm going to change my footwork a little bit because I know he's going to sit down at 11 yards and then he's going to work away. So if he, if I just, if I just play for him to sit down, he's going to work away from me like he did on tape, like he did on that first route. So what I need to do is boom, I see it. I saw it on tape. I saw it during the game earlier in the, earlier in the game. And then boom, I like cheated it just, just a second more. And like, that's when it all comes together and you make big plays and man, it's, I think it's so worth it. Well, that story right there sums up why you were who you went. And then on top of that, you score a touchdown and the place goes crazy and the guy falls out of the stands and you picked him up. So that's gosh, his face, the guy fell, he fell out of the crowd trying to celebrate with Luke as he ran into the end zone. And then all of a sudden Luke stops and we're like, what's going on? Where'd Luke go? Is he Okay. Cause Luke's like bending on the ground. Little do we know that a guy fell out of the bleachers and Luke stops in the mid celebration and helps pick him up. That was, that was an amazing night. That was, that was how uh, fun was that game? That was incredible. That was the best game of all time. We could have called anything, anytime, anywhere. And we would have, and it was going to work. All right. So I got two more things I want to get from you and I'm going to let you go. A lot of talk about your pop Warner skills. We're going down to Florida this week. Defensive coordinator. We're going to play teams from all over the country. It sounds like your high school. It sounds like we're St. X again. So you have a lot more experience with this than I do, but I want to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. The Panthers, the char- whoever calls you tomorrow. 
are you Jeff Saturday? Are you walking in there now that you're a big coach, now that you've won some championships <laughs> as a coordinator? Could you go coach an NFL team tomorrow? Man, I I think it'd be I think it'd be very difficult because there's so much more that goes into it. You know, it's not just it's not just defense, it's not just offense yeah. for you. It's everything. It's because I spent a year in 2020 in the front office and it's bringing guys in for workouts. How are we managing schedules? Where are we flying? Where, there's just so much stuff going on right now that I don't think I give him a lot of credit for going in there. And he's won games. He's yeah. had success early on. Obviously, no doubt. last week didn't didn't go. But I just I think it'd be so stressful for me. I think I'd be in over my head. Youth football trying to make sure I could get my substitutions in correctly. That's a, that's enough for me right now. <laughs> All right. Give everyone give everyone the lowdown now. All right. First season. We started on this. We're going to end mm-hmm. with this first season. Hardest thing about coaching, maybe that you didn't anticipate. Ooh, I think stuff, stuff that works for us in the NFL, it, it, it doesn't work in youth football. Like you don't some of like being complex. Like when the first game that we had, I like different pressures to different sides and like, all right, we're going to scheme this up and get this here. And then they get in the game and you run something and you're like, well, they did exactly what I asked them to do. It just didn't work. So I think the biggest change for me was, especially on the defensive side of the ball, is simple. Get them lined up, make sure it's very clear what their job is, and let them go. Because all of our kids, they're smart, they play super hard, they're tough, they want to win. So it's like, for us, for me on defense, it's really just get them set up and then get and then get out of their way. And I think that first game, I didn't do a very good job with that of like, it was like, why, why isn't this working? Why aren't they doing that? It's more of like, well, I was doing too much. I just need to let them line up. I need to let them have fun. I need to let them go play because it's not any different than the NFL when I sometimes felt like, why are we doing all this extra stuff? Like, can't we just line up and cover three and cover four and play football? And then now yep. as a coach for the first week and trying to do all this stuff, I'm like, I was exactly the guy that I didn't want to be when I was playing. Yeah. I, I always say to people when they ask, and I always argue with my dad about this, as you know, my dad coaches, we argue a decent amount, but we always end up getting it right. Because he always says to me, like what I've learned through coaching the younger age now, really for the first time as well with you, is it's not about who knows the most football. It's really irrelevant. It's who knows the most football that's relevant to fifth and sixth graders. Yeah. Because if we had a football contest, all of us would do great and we could go and talk and draw on the race board. But what we know is irrelevant. It's what do the kids know? And that yeah, like to me for, has been yeah. the most enjoyment. That's been the fun of it. And we learn along the way, just like last week with like de- when you, the coin toss at the beginning of the game, like if you defer, it's a huge positional battle because it's not like if you get the ball to start the game, you get the ball in with a 35 yard line. If you go three and out in the NFL, you can kick the ball 50 yards and the field flips. But in, in grade school football, majority of kids are going for it on fourth down. So say you get a four and out, you get the ball on the 43 minus or the plus 43 yard line going in. That's when, if you take the ball to start the game, that's the longest in the worst field position that you're going to have the whole game. So simple things like that make such a huge difference. No doubt. And this was all stuff that we, that we try to, like you said, we had to learn on the fly Mm -hmm. because none of us had ever really done it, but we figured it out. We got it right. Um, all right, I got one more story to tell, and I'm going to let you go because I know we got practice tonight, and I, and I need my defensive coordinator to start studying some film. <laughs> Which, by the way, we have a huge bracket reveal tonight. On the day that we're recording this, they do a bracket reveal. So after practice, we're taking the kids to like a local restaurant or whatever, and we're going to watch a live, it's like World Cup, like a live bracket reveal. So we're going to find out which of the seven other teams we're playing. So a lot of stress trying to figure out what we're going to do. But anyway, all right, so we used to be workout buddies. So take us back to 2020. It's COVID. I had a gym in my house. We had nowhere to go. So you come over one early morning. I'm up in the gym getting it organized. You know what story I'm going to tell? Yeah. You walk. It's the first time in my life where I ever saw Luke Keekly dominated, like straight up dominated, fearing for his life, pinned against the wall. (laughs) Would you like to tell the story? So I, I walk in, I walk into the house, you walk in the house, you can go up right upstairs to go to the weight room, or you can go left and come into the kitchen. And then the bar's right there. And I think all three kids are sitting there. So I walk in and I start messing with TJ and we're having fun and I'm joking with him. And um, all of a sudden I just hear, and this German shepherd's like, 
and he's got me pinned up against the island and he's barking at me and he's and he's huge he's huge and i've met him a gazillion times before and i've pet him and i've like hugged him and everything and like i think we're buddies but he thought i was being mean he thought i was like attacking tj and he's got me pinned up against the thing and i look at tj i'm like tj tell him like tell him everything's good and he looks at me he's like ha -ha. he starts laughing at me and i was like tj you need to tell I him to stop and tj is cracking up and it was it was it was it was funny after the fact but for a second there i was like i'm about to get eaten so i hear all this commotion downstairs so i come running down from the gym into the kitchen and Luke's like standing along the wall. T the dog is standing between him and the island where the kids are eating breakfast. I'm like, all right, come on, Tucker, come over here. And he then just like starts wagging his tail and like, he walks no away and jumps on his dog bed. Like, all right, I did my job. We laugh about that story. Every time Luke sees TJ, TJ's like, hey, Luke, remember when Tucker scared you? And uh, like, it's the best. I don't know. But that I've and seen he Luke said, Tucker get like you. I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, help me out. I've seen Luke Keekley get dominated one time in my life and it was by my dog and it's the best. And it's one of the all time favorite stories. So now, uh, now everybody knows that's your, that's your one, uh, your one week moment of your life. It's my Christmas that's night is dog. German shepherds at the Olsen's house. All right. Well, Hey buddy, I appreciate it, man. Get back to work. We got film study practice plan. No fun for you, man. We got a big grind this weekend down in Florida. We are going to take the kids to universal though. So that's going to be a blast. Be they should dude. It's, it's like the pro bowl. Yeah, Remember we went we to the it. Pro Bowl and they shut down Universal? Now yeah, we get we to do, do it again as youth week. football coaches. Talk about full circle. <laughs> Talk about full circle, how lives have changed. <laughs> be good, though. All right, buddy. Well, dude, you're the best. Um, again, thank Luke. You're the best, buddy. I appreciate you doing this. I hope everyone, uh, they're going to enjoy this conversation. You're the man. And I'll see you tonight at practice. Cool. Sounds good. All right, buddy. See ya. Sweet. I hope you guys enjoyed a little insight into what it's like when you're a professional football player, retired, turned youth football coach. It's not just me dealing with those struggles. I got a kid on the team, so I don't have a choice. But for Lou Keekley to agree to come join our craziness and uh, get a little taste of what it's like to coach youth sports and then obviously hear about his his childhood, him growing up in Cincinnati and the schools he played for and, and his recruiting trips and whatnot. It was just really cool to see like what is the path like for a potential future hall of famer like that's a pretty uh it's a pretty cool insight so appreciate luke joining us and uh talking about all that good stuff and at this time as you all know our favorite part of the show tasha is going to come on and uh we love hearing from you guys so tasha what do you have for us yeah so this one's from mike from instagram he says after many years in the league greg how is your body doing what exercises and stretches are your holy grail that's amazing. Well, I don't have many exercises or stretches. I, I don't really do any like organized formatted workouts, but good timing on the question. Cause last week for the first time, and I don't know the last time I played basketball, but I went to, at my kid's school, they do like men's pickup basketball nights once a week, where just like a bunch of dads and faculty and staff or whoever wants to, um, you know, meets at the gym at night and just plays like pickup basketball. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to go play. Like I want to get a good sweat, get a good run. It's full court. I haven't played full court basketball probably since high school. And, um, but it was great. I felt great. I was a little out of shape, but, uh, during the course of it, my, my feet, my, my knees, everything felt pretty good. Um, my basketball skills and my cardiovascular is a little out of shape, but, uh, the next morning I was sore. I got up out of bed. It's kind of moving a little stiff for a minute, but, uh, I'm going to try to go back this week. I, um, I play tennis a couple times a week and now I'm going to try to play men's basketball once a week, nothing too crazy. And, uh, that's about the extent of my training. But I, I think for everything that I've been through, the games, the practices, the years, the injuries, I find I feel like I'm on the good side of guys who retire and where my health is. So I feel pretty good. So you just keep moving your body, not like a set exercises. Yeah, just go to where the ball is. Were you the MVP the of that basketball game? No, there were some good guys. There was, there oh. were some young kids. Like there were some like 20 something year olds that still have like young legs, you know, they're fresh out of college and those guys, you know, they, they, there were some good kids out there. I had to like, I had to work. I, I, it was a wide array of guys, but, um, it was fun. I, I now know what to, now I know what to expect. I went in kind of as like the shy guy who's kind of new to the thing, but next time I go, I'm like, all right, I'm ready now. I'm going to go. Next time you're going to dunk on them. I'm going to go dominate. Yeah, I'm going to go exactly. dominate. <laughs> 
Um, our next question is from Frank from Instagram. He says, I'm a former D1 baseball player and I'm about to start coaching youth travel baseball. Do you have some core principles you recommend um, that he should bring to his youth coaching strategy? I love that. We need more young former players, guys that really love the game, and whether it's baseball in this case or just whatever the sport is, to go spend time with young kids and teach them the elements of the game. But I think my biggest my biggest tip would be don't get caught up with the young kids in like in the football wor- world we'd call it like the X's and the O's right like everybody wants the new play or the strategy or you know launch angle and how we hold our bet like there's plenty of time for the skill development if you're going to go coach and you're going to go invest your your time with these kids build a culture on the team first right what's the what are the expectations of the families what are the expectations of the players what does practice look like? What does the time commitment look like? How do we handle pre and post practice communication? Like a lot of the things that we talk about here on the show, like start there. There's plenty of time to teach them how to turn a double play. There's plenty of times to teach pickoff moves. Like, of course you want to teach the elements of baseball. That's why the kids are there, but start with the big picture stuff, build a great culture, build a great team, have parents and kids that want to play for you because they're learning more. It goes beyond just the actual game of baseball. Once you've got them in that regard, once they feel part of something, once they feel like they're at the right team, now it's easier to get them to buy into the techniques and the fundamentals and the skill sets that you're trying to develop, especially at the young age. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is don't get wrapped up early in, you know, what we, you know, the X's and the O's, right? Which is a kind of a football phrase, but it, it pertains to baseball or whatever the sport is. There's plenty of time for that. Develop the kids, teach them what the lessons are, give them the expectations of what it's going to take to play on your team. Once that's established, everything else from there will be easy. That's good stuff. And then our last question is Mike Frost from Instagram says, parents are purposely holding their kids back a grade to simply have them look better and to gain attention, not because they're doing poorly in school, but for sports, which seems crazy to him. So what do you think about that? Yeah, it, it's happening a lot. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is certain kids, I think there's twofold. I think there's kids that are being held back And they've just become like incredibly old, right? I always think of how old are you going to be when you graduate high school? Mm -hmm. To me, that's like the easiest bear to, because to say, all right, in sixth grade, you're 12. Like to me, that's hard. Like, all right, on your call, on your high school graduation day, call it May of your senior year in high school. How old are you? To me, if you're like right around 18, maybe you just turned 19 or you turn 19 in that summer after, like you should graduate high school somewhere around the 18 mark in my mind. There's kids now that are going to turn 19 the first couple months of the year, like in January, February, leading up to high school graduation. They're going to be 19 and three months, 19 and four months before their high school graduation. And I don't blame the parents because what's happening is, especially at some of the private schools, when you go take your you know young kid there to look at schools, if your kid is not of the appropriate age, they won't even consider putting them in kindergarten. So based on those kids that have those like weird early spring, late winter birthdays that are after the new year, a lot of those kids JK, and then they turn, they go into kindergarten and they're almost turning seven, right? They go into kindergarten, like well into their sixes. And then when you extrapolate that to your senior year, you're well into your eight teens when you start senior year. So it's kind of a catch 22. And then if you don't do it, your kid's 17 and the kid he's competing with is 19. It's a huge difference, right? So I think a lot of it is the cutoffs. There's no like pure cutoffs anymore. It's kind of up for interpretation. And I think we're creating a system where no one wants their kid to be at a disadvantage. No one wants to have their kid be the young, underdeveloped kid, especially if they want to be an athlete. And parents are doing what they feel like have to do to allow their kids to compete. So I don't blame them. I think it's a little bit of the product that uh, that we're living in. Yeah, I feel like I'm used to that. Like, I mean, I went to high school in Texas, so everybody was held back a grade. Like, yeah, right. no one was their age. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, and that's it, all hard. the fan questions. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah. But I, you know, know I, don't do. blame, I don't blame the parents one bit. I mean, I, I think within reason, I mean, you, yeah, you're not going to graduate high school at 20. But I think like within reason, if you have a late bloomer or you feel like your kid, like to give them that extra time in high school to develop, to mature, to grow, both physically, mentally, socially. Every kid develops at such a different rate that yeah. uh, no one knows their kid better than your parents. It's true. That's right. That's well, my that's TED all talk. The, 
That's the TED Talk of, of the day. <laughs> and that's all the fan questions we have for today. So you can keep submitting them at you think or at Greg Olson on TikTok, Instagram, or Twitter. Well, thank you yeah. so much, Tasha. As always, we appreciate mm-hmm. the questions. And thank you guys. We appreciate your guys submitting of the questions on uh, on social and email and whatnot. And we always enjoy talking about it. And you guys all send in some great thoughts and some great questions. So continue to do that. And uh, wherever you guys rate, wherever you guys get your pods, continue to rate, review, subscribe. And thank you guys so much. Uh, for following along here on You Think and see you guys next week.